Well, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is a day set apart to never forget the resurrection of Jesus our Lord from the dead. This is the most important event that ever happened in the history of the world. For if Jesus has not been raised, then we are still under the guilt of our sins. But Jesus has risen, and the possibility of the forgiveness of sins is real. The guilt that weighs down upon the hearts of those that know they are not at peace with God can be forgiven. I'm going to begin our time today by reading the account of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus from the dead in the Gospel of Matthew. At, Christ, at Christmas time, we often read these passages of the birth of Christ, but seldom do we read the narrative of the crucifixion, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and I find that it's very important to do so. You can follow along. We're going to be in the Gospel of Matthew or simply listen as I read this morning. Beginning in Matthew chapter 27, verse 11. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Verse 24, so when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, his blood be upon us and on our children. And then he released for them Barabbas and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. When the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him, and they stripped him, and put a scarlet robe on him, and twisted together a crown of thorns, and they put it on his head, and put a reed in his right hand, and kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him, and took the reed, and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. And as they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. And then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads, saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests and the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he, desires, if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split, and the tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs, after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion 
Those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place. They were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the Son of God. There were also many women there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, that is the day of the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead, and the last fraud will be worse than the first. And Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them, said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go tell my brothers, Go to Galilee, and there you will see me. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priest all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And the story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. And so we believe this morning that Jesus by the Holy Spirit is indeed with us to the end of the age, which means until he comes again, until there is no more of this earth, Jesus will be with us. It is my greatest prayer for you and the prayer of the elders of this church that this morning would not be about you hearing some nice music or seeing your friends or having a good lunch with, with people afterwards, but that you would be able to leave this place today saying, I have experienced something of the living God. It is our desire for you to know that Christ Jesus lives that he is not dead, but that he lives to make intercession before God the Father on our behalf. This morning, the sermon is going to come from Hebrews chapter 7. You can go ahead and turn there. Hebrews chapter 7 has to do with the intercession and the life 
of Christ. I know that many of you are familiar with the account that I have just read, and it is very necessary that you know the details of what is happening in the scriptures related to the life, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus from the dead. But it is also very necessary that you keep going from those things to understand the purpose and the outcome of the life of Christ and what they mean to us. What does it mean that Jesus has risen from the dead? As we study the scriptures, the main focal point of the study of scripture is to study Christ Jesus. And learning about Jesus is like looking at a diamond that has many facets to it. And as you hold it up to the sun in different directions, it shines in different ways. And so it is with Jesus that there are many layers of truth that unfold before us with Jesus. Unfold wonder. It evokes worship as these characters in this story did. The more they learned of Jesus, they quickly fell down at his feet and worshiped him. Jesus, in some ways, is like a great mountain of buried treasure, a mountain that doesn't look like much when you first look at it. Many people in their first pass with Jesus, they simply see a a man from Galilee, a great teacher. But the more that we learn about Jesus, we find that in him is the salvation of God. He is the knowledge of God's mystery. As Colossians chapter 2 says, in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. But it says they are hidden. It's something that you have to seek. And when you seek, you will find. The glorious knowledge of Jesus the Savior can never be exhausted because he is not a relic. He is not dead. He is living and he is active. And anything that is living is growing and we can seek and understand more and more and so it is with Christ Jesus. So as we look together this morning in Hebrews chapter 7, we will learn something of his priestly role. A priest is a bridge of relationship between God and humanity. The priests in the Old Testament had a role, and their role was to be those who spoke on behalf of God and helped everyday people have some encounter with God. They bridged the gap, and they were one who led people to understand who God was and what his requirements were so that they might walk in them. This passage before us in Hebrews chapter 7 will help us understand that the Old Testament priesthood was dying and inadequate. It could never accomplish what it was seeking to do. And it contrasts that old priesthood with the perfect priesthood of Jesus Christ. And the central element of all of this is the undying priesthood of Jesus. That because of his resurrection from the dead, And because he will never die again, he can intercede for us forever. That Jesus Christ can and will forever be the bridge between God and a lost and dying humanity. Jesus Christ will forever in his life be the one who intercedes on our behalf before God, fulfilling in himself the requirements of the law on our behalf. So we're going to read this morning Hebrews chapter 7, verses 11 through 28. I would ask you at this point to stand, to honor the Lord as we read his word this morning. Hebrews chapter 7, 11 through 28. Now if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one named after the order of Aaron? For when there is change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belonged to another tribe, one from which no one has ever served at the altar." For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah. And in connection with the tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. 
For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath, for those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds this priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins, and then for those of the people. Since he did this once for all, he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests. But the word of the oath, which came latter than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Please be seated. The opening assertion of this passage of Scripture is that the Old Testament Levitical priesthood, if it had been sufficient for salvation, there would be no need for Jesus. But it was insufficient for our salvation. They administered, these priests in the Old Testament, administered the Old Testament law of God. A law that can be broken into three basic categories. The ceremonial, the civil, the moral. The ceremonial law had to do with all the different intricacies of running the temple and the the calendar related to the temple. The civil law had to do with national Israel and the nation functioning as a nation of people set apart. And then there was the moral law, which has to do with God conveying his character to us to understand who he is. That nature of the law continues to our time. But all of this law is not sufficient to save anyone. As it says in verses 18 and 19, it is useless and weak to save, and no one was ever made perfect by it. The law reveals our sin. It shows us our imperfections and how impossible it is for us to keep all the standards of God. Every single person that tried to keep that law was unable to keep it. The priests, their actions there at the temple were symbolic. They were pointing forward to a future reality, a future hope of fulfillment. Every sacrifice that they offered was insufficient. No ram, no bull, no goat could ever sit in the the stead or be the atonement for an individual human being. But it was something that was symbolic of a thing that was yet to come. These priests in the Old Testament were ministering in a temple that would be destroyed. But it pointed to the hope of heaven a time where we will be in an indestructible place of glory with the Lord. They administered a law that they themselves could not speak, and they spoke of eternal life while they themselves would die. Everything about their priesthood was insufficient, but they were symbolic of Christ who was to come. They spoke of the Messiah that they waited for and hoped for. And so what we must understand this morning is that these symbolic things had no substance. The substance of these things was Jesus. Jesus is the substance of all the symbolism of the Old Testament. He is the fulfillment of all the hope of the Old Testament. He himself is the real ground of our salvation. Anyone that would take all the things of the Old Testament and relive and reenact those things and rejects Jesus does not understand the substance of salvation. Jesus is the true priest, the one able to intercede between God and man and bring salvation to us. 
And so the passage begins with the inadequacy of the Old Testament priest, but it focuses on the perfection of Jesus. Jesus is a priest or the one able to bring us to God, and he is from a different order, from a different tribe. He is not from the tribe of Judah, but from the tribe, I'm sorry, not from the tribe of Levi, but from the tribe of Judah, from a different order, not from the order of Aaron, but from the order of Melchizedek. There's a lot that could be said about Melchizedek, a mysterious character in the scriptures, but what will suffice this morning to understand is that Melchizedek is of the Lord. And so the origin of Jesus's ministry is divine. His calling, his command to take up the office of the great high priest is of a heavenly origin, not an earthly origin. In verse 19, it makes very clear that the ministry of Jesus is able to save, that Jesus is able to bring us close to God the Father. He is able to forgive our sins. And the foundation of all of this is in verse 16, a phrase that should be underlined if you have a paper Bible, by the power of an indestructible life. That's, a, that's an incredible phrase, an indestructible life. What does it mean for something to be indestructible? It means that it cannot be destroyed. And there is nothing in this world that is indestructible. If an engineer, we've got a lot of brilliant engineers in this congregation, if one of them could come up with an indestructible building material, you would be a bajillionaire. Because everything in this world, rust, heat, time, Energy, it destroys it. Everything crumbles and falls apart in this world. But the life of Jesus Christ is indestructible. He cannot be killed. Death cannot overcome him. Crucified, buried, yet raised to indestructible life. Jesus is the high priest, as it says in 22, verse 22. He is the high priest and guarantor of a better covenant because he lives and he will never die. Let's look a little bit in the difference between the old covenant and this new covenant that he is the guarantor of. The old covenant in the Old Testament was a conditional covenant. Conditional meaning if, then. Lots of passages about this in the Old Testament. If you keep all these laws, then I will bless you in this way. And the people would so often in a large gathering bigger than this say, yes, yes, we will keep these laws. And you turn the page, next page, they break all of them. And it's a mess. But we, we say, oh, what is wrong with these people? Why don't they obey God? But if we think very much about it, we realize that we're in the same boat. We hear these things that God would have us to do. And we say in our heart, yes, yes, Lord, we'll do these things. And then we go out and then we immediately fail. And so the conditional covenant of the Old Testament was not sufficient for salvation because no one could keep all these laws. But when we come to the New Testament, the if then of the covenant, the if is fulfilled by Christ. He's the guarantor. He's the one that's going to guarantee to God the Father that all the demands of the law are met. And so he walks and lives an incarnate life here on earth, lives as a human being, fully God, yet fully man. And as he lives, it's such a beautiful description in verse 26. It describes him as unstained. I want to bring that to bear in this. As Jesus lived his life in this world, he remained unstained by the world. He was righteous, doing everything required of him, abstaining from everything that ought to be abstained from. And you and I, every one of us, are stained by this world. As I have walked through this world and the sins that I have committed and the, the things that I have done, they have marked me and I am scarred by them. One day the Lord will remove those things from me. But Jesus walked through this world unstained by this world, perfect in his righteousness, fulfilling all the demands of the law so that he could guarantee salvation for those that he would grant it to. By grace and by mercy alone, the Lord Jesus grants salvation to those who believe in his name because he met the demands of the law and then laid down himself as a substitute for those that would believe in him. Verse 27 is very clear about this. 
that Jesus is the guarantor because he is the pardon for, of, our, of our sins. He lays himself down. The Old Testament priest brought other things to bear that their own sins might be forgiven and there would be symbolism of the sins to be forgiven in the future. But Jesus, as the perfect sacrifice, substitutes himself in all of his perfection, meeting all the standards of God in his own life, laying himself down as a sacrifice to guarantee the pardon of sins for all of those who believe in him. This is a beautiful reality and something that we must understand comes to us by grace. I'm going to keep talking about this as we go. But verses 24 through 28 outline so many different amazing things about the ministry of Jesus to us. He holds this priestly office by holding his position permanently because he will never die. Today is a beautiful occasion. And we have many occasions in our life that we wish we could hold on to for a long time, but they, they fleet away and Monday comes and difficult things happen and we remember back to those occasions. But one of the things I want you to grasp about the priesthood of Jesus Christ and his granting to you of eternal life is that the goodness and the glory of Jesus will never fade. The eternal life of Jesus Christ is granted to those who trust in him and it will continue forever. Ever, because he continues in his priestly office forever because he never dies. He is permanently upholding the salvation of those who come to him. But verse 25 says of how he will be able to save us to the uttermost or completely. The salvation of God coming to us as a complete salvation, there's at least two different ways that we can understand that. It first of all means that God saves us in a complete way. The salvation of God is not something that is religious and over here in the corner. Many would have you to believe that, that what we're doing here is only for Sunday morning. But the salvation of Jesus Christ is a complete salvation which changes us mind, body, and soul. It changes us into a different person than who we were before. We were dead, and in Christ we are alive and we become a different person. It is a complete change. It takes time, but it carries on. And the other aspect of the complete salvation of Jesus Christ is that it does not end. And so it will be something that carries on forever. That's why it's referred to as eternal life. Also in verse 25, it talks about the indestructible resurrection of the life of Jesus and that he lives forever to intercede on our behalf. This is very much about the priestly role of Jesus. You have God the Father and us, and we know that there is a distance between the two of us. And so Jesus is the one who, just don't lose sight of this, he lives to intercede for you, to make the connection between you and God the Father, that you might have a real, personal, and intimate relationship with Almighty God. I want to read a quote from J.C. Ryle. He says this, The wounds of the Lord Jesus Christ are ever before God the Father. The nail prints in His hands and feet, the marks of the spear in His side, the thorn marks upon His forehead, the marks of all that He suffered as the Lamb slain are in a certain sense ever before God the Father in heaven. While Christ is in heaven, the believer's old sins will never rise in judgment against him. Christ lives, and those old sins will not condemn him. We have an ever-living, ever-interceding priest. Christ is not dead, but alive. It's a powerful picture, a picture that you need to not forget. There's a a, a account in the scriptures of a man named Thomas, one of the disciples, not believing in Jesus and saying, I'll never believe until I see him resurrected. And Jesus reveals himself to him and has Thomas touch the wounds on his hands and feet and side. And what should not be forgotten about that is that it is after the resurrection. Jesus is glorified in a, in a, in a way that the disciples sometimes don't even recognize him. But yet what does he still bear? He bears the wounds of the cross in his own body. And so it is right for us to believe that Christ incarnate forever will bear the wounds of the cross 
always remembering what was born in his own body on our behalf. And this is part of his intercession for us because he loves us. Verse 26, he is described as innocent, holy, unstained, separated from sinners, exalted in the heavens. Three days after his death, rising from the grave, never to die again. The life of Christ Jesus cannot be extinguished. He has met the demands of the law. He is full of grace and mercy and ready to have you share in his resurrection life. The life of Christ is to be given to you and to me that we might live also because he lives. I want you to understand this morning without any doubt that Jesus is not seeking for you to work for him. Jesus has fulfilled all the demands of the law. You cannot fulfill the demands of the law. He has completed the work. What Jesus seeks this morning is that you believe in him, that you love him, that you worship him in the splendor of his holiness. Because one day, every single one of us will stand before God, and it will not be in mass like this. It will be one person at a time, giving an account for the life that you lived. And you will either stand before God alone, or you will stand with Jesus Christ as your intercessor and great high priest, standing before God the Father, making the case for why it is that you ought to be forgiven, because he has fulfilled the demands of the law and provided his grace in substitution for you that you might be saved. But there will be those that stand there alone and empty. And those that want to plead before God the case of their own life and the good works that they have done. But I want you to think hard about that. Because if you had to give an account for your life today, you know in your own heart that there's nothing that you can plead. Because you know, if you are honest with yourself, that every one of your deeds are compromised. There's so many things you should have done that you didn't do. Things that you shouldn't have done that you have done. You know that even the best of your deeds are compromised by lust and greed and selfishness and anger. And if you can't make your case to your own conscience, how can you make that case before God? You can't. There is only one hope for you. And that hope is to ask for forgiveness. Lord Jesus, will you forgive me of all my sins? And the glory of the gospel is that Jesus will say, yes, I forgive you for your sins. I have paid the price for your sins because I love you and I will forgive you. Come near to me. By grace and mercy, you are forgiven. And this is glorious. Because no person will ever ask for forgiveness that does not believe in Jesus. I think some people mistakenly think that belief and asking for forgiveness are somehow separated from each other, but they're not. They're bound up together in one great action. Because no one will ever ask Jesus to forgive them who does not believe that Jesus is Lord. And no one that believes that Jesus is Lord will not ask him to forgive them. Because they know that they're a sinner when they recognize Jesus as who he is. And so my prayer this morning is that those of you that know Christ Jesus will worship him for the salvation that he has brought to you. And those of you that don't know Christ, today you will ask him to forgive you. You will believe in him. That this Easter you will recognize Jesus for who he is, the Son of God, risen to eternal life, full of mercy and grace, that you will confess your sins and believe and that you will receive the eternal life of Jesus Christ and share in the indestructible life of Christ. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for this time. Thank you for this beautiful day. You have created this day. Thank you for the mercy of it that we might gather here together. Thank you for the truth recorded for us in Scripture of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead that you, as you were mocked on that cross, you did not come off that cross because it was the bearing of our sins. You stayed upon that cross because of your love for us. Father, we rejoice in the hope of Christ today. We call upon those who do not know Christ, that they might believe in him today and experience the resurrection life of Jesus. 
Help us, Lord, this time would be greatly refreshing that we would remember your intercession for us, that we would never lose hope in the Christian life, that we would go out from this place in hope and in passion for Jesus. We love you, we worship you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.